us on the DCTV, he said, without a question mark, because he doesn't know. Hey, um, so uh, uh, this... Uh, since since we're not live on here, you know, you know, Justin and I keep listening to uh, Harmontown, and uh, yeah, yeah, they uh, uh, Illuminati room Harmon Harmontown. Um, it's, it's an old old Reddit thread um, from last year, but uh, uh, someone uh, they were so so. I don't think it's relevant uh, on weird things, but like one of these days, this is the kind of things. We'd have to, to do. Duncan Trussell brought this up on Harmontown, uh, asking, uh, this is the Zaza Hotel in Houston, Texas. And, oh, here we go. And um, he was just weirded out by this room that he was in, like, uh, uh, like weird ass uh, art on the wall with skulls. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, like, like, up here, there's a random pack of Marlboro cigarettes. And, uh, weird art and more weird shit. And, um, like one of the things people noticed was that, and then like this weird ass portrait of this dude. Um, and boop, boop, boop. And then like, uh, somebody pointed out that the mirror was like, obviously a two way mirror because it's recessed into the, into the faux bricks. Mm -hmm. So it's like half the size of a normal room or whatever. And, uh, and, uh, somebody, you know, immediately the conspiracy theorists start coming out of the woodwork saying that, uh, it's room 322, which is a soul associated with the skull and bones, uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, Cause they're known for like, you know, supporting, you know, hipster art communities. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. But this is the one, the weirdest part is he posts this on here, uh, which is someone <laughs> telling him that they'll send him a thousand dollars if he deletes his post and shuts the hell up. And uh, uh, anyway, um, it sparked a bit of a, a, a run like a Houston Chronicle ended up uh, writing a little blog on it. And, you know, and, and of course, the you know, this is the brilliant thing about conspiracy theorists is there's literally nothing you could say that will placate them. Like, yeah. like their answer to everything is, well, of course they'd say that. But you're telling me it's just a coincidence that burda, 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 that kind of thing. There's a... Uh... Have you seen the documentary The Institute? Uh, no. So in Oakland area a few years ago, these weird things, these weird flyers started popping up like, you know, get your own personal divorce field, you know, poly water, da 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 da. And, and then if you follow the phone number, it told you to go to this address, which was in the financial district, and you went to the front desk, somebody would give you a key, and you go to this room, and there is this induction thing for – this thing, the Jejun Institute, which, right? which oh, is, yeah, no, that's like, yeah, that's a, that's a thing. What, yeah. So the, the documentary the on Netflix now about it called the Institute. And then it's, it's the people who created this thing, talk about it. Um, and I, I kind of, I only got halfway through cause they started playing some of the films and stuff you watched and they're kind of boring if you're not in the middle of it. Yeah. But, uh, they talk about like getting calls and people like that who think this stuff is real. And the guy who created this thing, because at first, like the first 10 minutes, you're like, okay, show me the creators because we know this is just a, 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 a lark. And then the creator's like, yeah, we didn't expect people to take it that serious because it was obviously a prank. But we had people who bought and thought this was real and then were upset when they realized it was just an ARG. And Oh, that's right. I think I did hear about this now that I think about it. Um, yeah, and so well, that... And, and it was like like famous people got taken by it too, right? Uh, they're, they're, they were quoting it like on other podcasts saying like, no man, you don't understand. this. Uh, have you read this? Look up this. Um, like, like, like television, mind control, something or other. Maybe. Is that... I don't remember. You know, and, and you know, as you probably know, I've been planning my own cult and doing research. Well, good. Um, All right, here, I'm going to tweet out that we're about to start. Uh, hey, gang. If you've never caught the Weird Things podcast live, now's your chance. HTTP. Uh, Diamondclub.tv. Boom. Womp, 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 womp. 
What? I just started sending stuff out on the weird list, by the way. Oh, right on. That's fantastic. Uh-huh. I guess uh, I guess we need to collect on our first Patreon because we launched it before uh, uh, before that thing. Um, yeah. All right, glass of water, real quick. All right, you got it. What a diva. Look at me. I need water for sustenance. My name's Justin <laughs> Robert Young. Meow. <laughs> Uh, let me see. I think. Yeah, there we go. Do a little bit of that. Do a little bit of these. So, have you seen uh, this place called Rocket Fizz? It's these Sounds candy cool. and soda pop stores. And they do their own kind of like, go to rocketfizz.com. Rocket Fizz. I met the owner last night, and he's offered oh, to let wait. me have... Uh, th- th- these guys aren't on uh, Venice Beach, are they? They probably have one there. Yeah. They got, like, penis pops and stuff? Oh, maybe. Um, I uh, had to steer no, away. wait. Hold on. Let me see. Yeah, let me see. They've got a... Uh, they got a lot of locations. Well, they're in Venice, but they, have, they got a lot... Of, anyway, they offered, they offered me... I uh, met the owner. wanted to know if I wanted to have my own soda pop. That's My awesome. Are you kidding me? I think I'm going to take him up on that. Heck yeah. Yeah, they've got one in Austin, too. Oh, right on. We'll have to, we'll have to go check that out. Um, yeah, we could, I could probably talk to them about, uh, you know, doing a, you know, we could do Weird Things Pop, maybe a Scam Pop, Ooh. maybe a, 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 a Jury Pop. Oh, yeah. What about a Pop and Lock? Can we do that? Pop. Pop and lock. There you go. All right, man. Let's set levels and get a little weird. Hello. Check. This is Brian talking. Peeking out at about negative 12. Let me hear you, Andrew. Hi, I'm Andrew, and this is me talking. Peeking out at about 13. Yeah. Typical you. Justin? Hi. I'm Justin. My name is Justin. I talk on podcasts. Hello, 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 hello. Yeah. Right on. All right, here we go. I'm going to kill this. Then I'm going to delete this. And then we're ready to go in five, four, three. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Weird Things podcast made possible by listeners like you and Patreon. Patreon.com slash weird things. And you can help make all this weirdness keep coming. I keep waiting for that to be a bit, but that's really us now. We're full, yeah. fully indie and listener supported. Thanks to you guys. That's Brian Brush. Should you hear? And the next voice you should hear is Justin Robert Young. I mean, it's not like we're. I mean, like because we were kind of always indie. Like we're just like we were homeless people who now have jobs. What, well, yeah. Well, you just find yourself like doing an impression of uh, NPR, but then you realize like, no, we're not doing an impression. We're doing the same thing that they do. And, and like, I'm Andrew May. Oh, hey, hey, Andrew. The <laughs> Ira like, Glass of Weird Things. <laughs> <laughs> by, by far, uh, in my top five favorite jokes of, of BoJack Horseman is a complete non sequitur where they're in a meeting with an agent and the, uh, the, the ghostwriter for the celebrity's book phone goes off and it's just, hi, I'm Ira Glass. This is your phone ringing. Everybody has a story, and this is your phones. It's ringing. <laughs> That's awesome. Gentlemen, enough of this nonsense, all right? We got to dive right in. We got a lot to cover, a lot of ground to cover here, okay? Let's now go. that we have this Patreon launched, I think it's time we start thinking about an HQ. Uh, head, uh, head, headquarters? Yes, Brian. Okay. You got the memo. Good. I, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't some other HQ. High quartzing. <laughs> yes. No, that is wrong, Justin. Point to Brian. <laughs> Justin, yes. sit in the corner. Gentlemen, we need to have an HQ. We need to have a headquarters. We need to have a high court scene. We need to have a place. We can rest our hats. We can plan our missions. Like Ghostbusters, what do they have? They had this cool firehouse, right? And they had these cool ambulance turned, you know, Ecto-1, you know? I think it was a hearse, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, well, I had windows. Yeah. I don't know. But anyhow, they had them, right? Yeah. Um, no, they did. Justice League, they got like a space station. Oh, see, I'm still old school. I'm thinking about that Hall of Justice sitting mm-hmm. sitting down on City Street. 
<laughs> and I live right down the street from the Hall of Justice, by the way. Do you? Well, like Warner uh, Warner Brothers Studios, they actually like painted one of the back ends of it. You drive by, it's painted like the Hall of Justice, and they're all like flying out, you know. That's awesome. And then there's like static shock there too. You're like, how? Oh, what? We- um, <laughs> and then like, listen, Avengers. They got like Stark Tower, like West Coast Avengers. Remember that that title, the West Coast Avengers? Like, hey man, they, they were, were out of the Playboy too. Mansion, right? What's that? They were out of the Playboy Mansion, the West Coast Probably. Avengers. Pretty much. Yeah, they're like, hey, man, we're Avengers, too. Like, uh, was you it, know. Wasn't it, was it Tony Stark more West Coast Avengers than, like, uh, in, in the, than regular Avengers? I guess some of that gets massaged. I mean, I, you know, freaking over the years, everyone's been an Avenger. Like, in fact, there was a – do you remember the Marvel comic, What the? Uh, W-H-A-T-T-H-E, question mark, exclamation point, um, in Terabang. Uh, they, uh, they, they did like a, a faux what if. So it starts off the watcher is just like, what if when yeah. someone called Avengers assembled, all the Avengers actually assembled. And so like, like so many people have been Avengers over the years. And like one guy calls and then like, you know, 800 different Marvel superheroes show up for it. <laughs> oh, that's amazing, Brian. Now, can I carry on with this? Yes. Sorry. We need a headquarters, Brian. Like, uh, it should be a laboratory of somebody who went insane, you know, like maybe an observatory. I I have something in mind. All right. I'm saying subterranean. Like you could only be able to get in by by finding an old laundry chute that you have to climb into. No, it's not that. We'll have a laundry chute for you to climb through, though, if that'll make you happy. I've got a building in my, I've got it in front of me, guys. I got this right here. I found the oh, place. All right. Okay. That's fine. Go. All right. Let, let, let us know what's going on. Okay. Now, it's, it's like a former like water facility. So it's big, it's very industrial. Right? Yeah. Uh, former water facility? Wait, is it? Uh, yeah, it's like, it's like four acres. It's like four acres. Oh, okay? uh, that's good. We can, uh, is, is, it, is it located conveniently? It's gonna be. It's in the East Coast. Uh, oh, yeah, that's fine. You know, that's uh, I can make that work. North or south? Let me ask you guys a question. Did you like the wire? <laughs> Is it in Baltimore? <laughs> maybe, maybe, but you didn't answer my question. Did you like the wire? I mean, is this in Hamsterdam? Is that is, is that is that where you're gonna set us up? We're just gonna squat in a few houses. I got a lot in common with Hamsterdam in its own weird way, but. <laughs> All but right, we, so you're saying four acres, a former water treatment plant in Baltimore. Mm-hmm, now, when mm-hmm. you say water treatment, is this more like a salt water treatment or a fresh water treatment? I'm sure there's salt in there. <laughs> All right, listen, let's just cut to the chase. It sounds like you're going to put us up in a doo-doo butter factory. <laughs> okay, listen. Let me explain something first. I had a story we could have done before, and I was trying to find the right way to phrase it, and I think we talked a little about, which was these guys working at a waste plant, and like, what's like the what's the worst thing in the world you have to worry if you're working at a waste plant? The worst disaster? Uh, choking to death on condoms as you slip and fall into the treated treating water. All right, you win. That's better than what I was gonna go. <laughs> God, what a way to go out, <laughs> Justin. No, I'm going to double down on Brian's. Uh, I really don't feel like that's uh, that you're going to do any worse than that. You're, if, if well, that's... I would say you're almost right. But like I had one before, and what it turned out was some waste worker facilities, uh, waste waste, work, waste management guys, uh, were almost hit by a meteor. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, wait, so, so, so they're just minding their own bees, minding other people's they're BMs. They're carefully grabbing the railing, eyes on the ground, making sure they don't fall in and choke on used condoms. All right? <laughs> And then right before impact, a freaking space rock, just like how close are we talking? Are we talking five feet, 50 feet? We're talking like five feet or something like that. Uh, So, yeah, this was a man believes debris fell from sky onto Secaucus wastewater treatment plant. Oh, my God. All right. And so, and so, so when you say debris, I I assume like like uh, is this like a, a you know I don't know like a SpaceX extra baggage? They just look like heat off? tiles. They look like they look like they fell off some satellite or something. Oh my gosh! So it's it's man made. So this wasn't even. I'm thinking we may have a a, a lawsuit case here against uh, space. I think well, <laughs> uh, Jones versus space. <laughs> Two workers were walking by at the time of the incident. It shook the guys up a little bit because it shook the guys up a little bit because, quite frankly, if it would have hit them, it would have killed them. 
Um, but that's not that we're not going to be there, guys. That's not going to be our facility. We're oh, not, thank we're not, I'm not talking about that. All right. Well, that's that's for 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 uh, uh, good because that so, facility sounds like it's a hazard, and yeah. uh, no. I I requested it be shut down immediately. This one has a roof over it, guys. Oh, this one didn't even have a roof over it. Uh, There's a roof over it. Okay. Well, so we'll we'll shut we'll shut we'll shut it just shut that water part down whatever you can have this facility are we in for it four acres guys four acres think of what we could do with four acres so all right so just so I understand the bill of sale here we're shutting down the doo doo butter part of the doo doo butter factory like it's just gonna be a bunch of abandoned old like hallways and machines yeah and and pretty much what you would expect with that. Can we convert uh, one of those giant? Well, I guess okay. When you say what you'd expect, I assume we're, we're looking at, at dried, dried dew everywhere. Oh, I'll clean that. I, that we'll sh- the water will let the clear water flow through there for days, whatever. Don't worry about that. Okay, how long does it have to go before you feel comfortable taking 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 one of those holding tanks and turning it into a swimming pool, like just for grins? I would say that'll give you all the chlorine you need. You'll feel fine about that. Really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, this seems like a trap. <laughs> I'm trying. I can't. I can't figure you it out. Six year history of doing the show. Why would you think that? Hold on. Hold on. Uh, is it? You want to know why you make a really compelling argument, Andrew? We're moving in. <laughs> is it? Well, hold on. It's stock and barrel. Is it? Is, so there's got. Okay, Justin. This is sidebar. Totally not a trap, and we perfectly uh, have matched this facility. Justin, uh, real quick, can I have a word with you? All uh, right, what's look, up? There's got to be. There's okay. Is there something I don't trust? I don't trust Andrew Maine. I don't know where I picked that up. I think that's something my mom it's used to tell really me. Really compelling argument when he said that over the last six years we've been doing this show, <laughs> he has not tricked us once. So, uh, what do you think? Do you think uh, you think it's haunted, uh, infested with uh, with with goblins, uh, plague rats? Man, I ain't afraid of no ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you just say we should go. Oh, how much is it? We should have. To, hey, uh, Andrew, how much? How much is the facility? I'm gonna give it to you for a dollar. <laughs> oh my god, uh, uh, Brian, that's, that's a really I'm good. I'm sorry, deal. <laughs> but if it is haunted, it's haunted with value <laughs> at a dollar for four acres in a major metropolitan area. Brian, we're gonna make money on day one of this deal. Okay, look, this is how they unload like EPA uh, shut down. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, what? Why is it? Why aren't they using this anymore? Hey, Andrew. Um, well, they're they're using. I'm I, this hype. They're still using it, but this hypothetical. Yeah, I, I, all right, I, all right. I, I'm shutting it down to sell it to you guys. Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it haunted? No. You don't sound very confident. Is, is something weird's going that was on a here? Definitive no. That was a, <laughs> if you were to write that in text, it would just be dot 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 n o. Okay. Wait, wait. What would you be? Okay. So it's operational they're treating wastewater right now mm-hmm. he says it's haunted with a question is is it is it is, it, is there a biological beings is there an inf- is it infested with something what's it infested with <laughs> well we're brian just, just we're jump. gonna make uh well, okay you, what would be a deal breaker infestation for you <laughs> holy cow uh I, I what would you not want it to be infested by, Brian? Oh, cockroaches in the biggest way. Like, uh, like I remember when I was working. Oh, co- I, this is probably a hundred percent cockroach-free, Brian. Oh, dude. Well, then what? Uh, is, uh, are, are there rats? I, by the way, I remember the story of them. Someone saying that um, uh, you know, at uh, uh, um, was working at a major theme park in uh, Orlando, Florida, and uh, somebody was saying that uh, just on a lark, some. Um, the, the way he tells the story is that some security guard took a bug bomb and threw it down one of those drainage sewer pipes uh, just to see what would come out and outpoured just carpets, just waves of of uh, uh, cockroaches. And eventually they started to change colors as they came from deeper. They turned white as they were oh. coming out, you know, like like had never seen the light of day, just flowing out like waves. And I remember being so horrified by that idea. Um, so that's, that's my deal breaker. Uh, rats, rats like the doo-doo, right? Um, uh, the rats might be too scared to go in here. <laughs> so is it, is it, uh, cause everyone's having too much fun in our um, new headquarters, Brian. Is it snakes? Is not it not snakes, Brian? It's, 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 it's alligators. Not alligators, Brian. Brian, how many things do you have to guess? Uh, this is, uh, we're, we're already down to your eighth or ninth deal breaker. 
Uh, I, mean, I guess I guess I'm not. I mean, goblins is the only thing that's. And, and to be See, honest, all these things that you say that you're afraid of, they're not there. I think you're fine. What's the hesitation here, guys? Uh, uh, never one, none on this side of the screen. <laughs> this side of the screen is already packed. Did, does it have electricity? Yeah, I assume it does. I assume it has, it has electricity, all that Brian. God, what could it be infested with? I, I got Brian, bats. What you bats. Need to do is take a deep breath. And give a yes or no answer, no pressure on this very simple question. All right, it's too good a bargain to to pass up. Yourself and your entire family, along with us, into this facility. All right, I guess I'll explain to Penelope, Josephine, Calliope, Bonnie. Gather around, kids. Uh, Listen, every so often you get a deal of a lifetime. And when that opportunity comes, you strike. You take it. You, you strike like a tiger that might be haunting that place. Uh, I, I, we're moving. We're in. Good. Hooray! Because I'm going to tell you what, Brian. Some people would hesitate, but there's nothing living here that wouldn't naturally exist there. What naturally exists in Bal- Baltimore is where this is? Yeah, what I'm saying is, is, that, is that sometimes, oh. like, hypothetically, what's, what's a creature or something you don't like? Uh, something, something gross and slimy slugs. Or something you might expect, though, to find in a big, huge cavernous... I would say spiders. Oh, it's, let's say spiders. Just, just purely, just purely for theoretical argument's sake, okay? How many spiders? Yeah, but spiders are predators, and they need lots of bugs. I guess there's lots of bugs. And so, so let's say you have spiders. Let's say there may be a few spiders in there. Justin, if there was one spider in there, would you say, no, I'm not moving in? Oh, uh, sweet Lord. I would treasure it to become the mascot. I'd, <laughs> I'd walk in every day and, and talk to it. Hear that, Brian? Yeah, no, I, I'm down too. I mean, I'm down with, the, uh, uh, you know, one one spider. Uh, I, you know what? I'll say 100 spiders. I'm cool with okay, 100 but, spiders. But you know, four acres is a lot of space, a lot of area. Thousand how many spiders. spiders. Brian, how many spiders are in the room you're in right now? Uh, at least seven, I would imagine. Justin? Oh, here? Yeah. 51. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess like whatever the average, I don't know if there's an, an average of spiders per room just in a naturally occurring place. How many spiders are we talking about? What's the expected number, Brian? I would say, okay, now I, I, I would say it has to be so many spiders that I couldn't really even estimate the number property. I would assume there has to be so many that you have to express of them and think of them in volume. Like okay. I would say a uh, 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 hundred cubic feet of spiders is enough spiders to last me. I'm not ready to get out Wolfram Alpha and do the math right now. Well, I w- I, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. I'm going to sell you something right now. I'm going to sell you on a vision, on an idea. Okay. Yep. I want you to imagine how cool would it be to own something that nobody else owns? Pretty rad. Something that many people may pay to come see. Oh, like, uh, like, like we could, well, th- th- this could be another passive source of income. We could run mm-hmm. along with, and patrons can come in for free where mm-hmm. they can see the, uh, the, the weird things, uh, sideshow circus where we would show, you know, maybe get our hands on a Fiji mermaid or some pickled, uh, three headed babies or whatever. We only need one attraction, Brian, one attraction. You ready yeah? for this? What is it? Wrap your head around this idea. Okay. Four acre spider web. Oh my God. You're talking about that's the end of Kingdom of the Spiders from the 1970s, starring uh, 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 starring uh, uh, William Shatner. Do Do you remember the end of that movie? That's that's. Um, the, I imagine that involved a very large spider web. No, yes, like like. The, oh my god, I had nightmares when I was. I saw it when I was like four or five years old, and uh, it's you know it's one of those waves of spiders coming to get you movies, and they're all tarantulas, and they kill a million tarantulas during it. But then the last scene is they make it through the night. They run a fire uh, to keep them from coming in through the chimney or whatever, and then they go and they pull off the the boards because it would make sense for you to board up the windows uh, to keep spiders out, and they they pull it off and they look out. Out, and the entire city, like four acres of right. it, is covered in spider webs. Uh, it was d- horrifying to me. From Wired Online, four acre spider web engulfs building. 
Okay. Holy and cow. this apparently was a report. Uh, it was a, there was actually in like the entomological society, whatever. Back in 2009, the wastewater treatment plant in Baltimore put out a call for extreme spider help when a giant spider web covering almost four acres of their facility. Scientists eventually estimated over 107 million spiders were living in the structure with densities of 35,000 spiders per cubic meter in some spots. Oh, my God. Uh, That's not a hooch, man. Here's, here's the title of the article from American Entomologist. An immense concentration of orb-weaving spiders with communal webbing in a man-made structural habitat. This is from the paper. These are scientists, sober-minded scientists. We were unprepared for the sheer scale of the spider population and the extraordinary masses of both three-dimensional and sheet-like webbing that blanketed much of the facility's cavernous interior. Far greater magnitude than any previously recorded aggregation of orb weavers, the visual impact of the spectacle was nothing less than astonishing. In places where plant workers had swept aside the webbing to access equipment, the silk lay piled on the floor in rope-like clumps as thick as a fire hose. Dude, we're looking at an artist's rendition of what it looked like because apparently someone has posted the entire Kingdom of the Spiders movie to to YouTube. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is horrible. So, 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 like, were these poorly attended areas that they just they just looked over and they're like, "Oh, look at that! It's covered everywhere." Brian, you saw the wire. <laughs> Touche, sir. I'm just saying we could the have had another spiders season on in this. Baltimore. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I'm sending you a link. So, like, yeah, you know, like Amsterdam. It was like let's let's collect all the city spiders in one spot. Um, and so, wow. All right, let me do this. You got to see this photos. Uh, I mean, it's 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 like first thing you'd step in there and you look up. Oh my God! You would think, yeah, uh, geez, Louise, that looks like it looks like, uh, like an artistic. Uh, project. Oh, it's artistic. <laughs> so that had to just slowly. How long do you think that took for them to build? Over how long? You know, you see one, two, three, well, five. Because that's, that's what I have. Like the 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 headline engulfed makes it seem like all of a sudden there was just this uh you know this this big push of a spider web that that enveloped the building like it was a hurricane or something. Like this has to happen over a period of time, right? Yeah. Tragedy of the Commons. I mean, I guess, but but I mean, at at some point, like like somebody has to. It's a, wait. When you're saying tragedy of the Commons, do you mean like for the spiders? Like the spiders are like, hey man, you know where there's lots of bugs and you get them for free. You don't have to pay rent or nothing. Just come on over to the sewage treatment plant. And he shows up, and <laughs> and it's like, oh, they've abused the system. They all defaulted on the prisoner's dilemma, and now there's no bugs for any of us. <laughs> Also, Brian. by the way, there's really like these, there's very, oh, wait, hold on. I'm seeing some more different photos. Yeah, it looks like it's like just everything in the rafters was all completely covered over in webs. Well, and this is the freaky part is is it does this um, as the, as if it was designed on, perf, uh, on, on purpose. You know, it's like if you get enough trials, you sort of find the geomet geometrically most stable thing. So it's like it looks like somebody draped in reverse gravity like just some silk over the ceiling and uh and uh, like no, you know, it looks it looks like this is like a spooky halloween in the baltimore water treatment plan uh yeah man a hanging light fixture two and a half meters long pulled out of place by spider webbing there are so many spiders that it pulled this free hanging fluorescent light over a, a good okay at what point do you decide working at this facility that it's like you don't want to mess with them? You don't want to clean it up because there's a strange and ethereal beauty to it. At what point do you just become comfortable with it and just just wish that no one would mess with it? Uh, the moment I show up at work. <laughs> you instantly are just like, it's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, like, if, if it's pulling a free-hanging uh, fluorescent light, at what point are you considered legitimate prey for these spiders? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's become large enough that it could ensnare a human. These are, uh, uh, what was the kind of, how big are these? They're, they're what, orb spiders? Is that what they were? Yeah, they're orb, they're harmless. Come okay. on. Man. 
the 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 scientists described their estimate of thirty five thousand spiders per meter cubed as markedly conservative. So so that's a, uh, for cubic meter thirty five thousand. Like I I am sitting, I occupy a cubic meter of space. Picture yourself uh, bent over, hunched down in a three foot by three foot by three foot crate. Okay, that that is you occupying a cubic meter. Now picture the markedly conservative estimate of 35,000 spiders in there with you. Yeah. So we're saying yes. Sign it to papers? Actually, yeah. I'm down with it. I, I, it just seems right for us, right? In all the horrifying scenarios that we've done on this show, eh, it doesn't seem so bad. It's pretty, pretty badass, actually. It seems like a... I mean, we I could think clean some up cool lights and stuff. It'd be, I mean, I'm, you know, wearing my spider-proof suit there. We could throw in like some disco lasers and throw a rave in there, dude. Spider rave. It's oh. uh, <laughs> what do you mean? Okay. All right, gentlemen. Next topic. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You ready? Um, I'm sure you guys heard about this. Maybe even talked about this. But I thought, you know, this really should be approached for weird things. Um. Uh, we've all had some experience in television. Sure. Um, I've watched it once or twice. Being on it, doing whatever like that. Um, and, uh, have you heard about an upcoming, upcoming Discovery Channel special? No. Uh, full disclosure, uh, Scam School is produced by Discovery Network Communications. Well, uh, Discovery has found somebody who's got a very interesting thing that they're going to try to portray, they're going to show, they're going to do. Um... You know what this is, Brian? I, I think I do. Is this is this is this uh, a a uh, member of our um, uh, uh, circus brethren? Perhaps. <laughs> do you know about this, Justin? I am unaware of this. Okay. No, it, what is, it what has is nothing to do with the Nicki Minaj song. <laughs> circus brethren. That's my favorite Nicki Minaj yeah. song. Uh, Anaconda. Uh, wait, Anaconda? You heard about this? Oh, I thought you were talking about the dude uh, who who is doing the tightrope walking. Oh, no, 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 Brian, tie rope is so old, so lame. No, no, no. Um, type in Discovery Channel and Anaconda. There you go. Oh, my God. A guy who says he's got a uh, steak-proof suit is, says he's going to let an anaconda swallow him, and then they're going to pull him back out with a rope. With a rope? Well, you got to get him out somehow. That, thing, that thing's so dead. They're going to they're gonna slice that thing open, and he's going to get out. Um, Created a snake- Proof suit. In a Discovery Channel special titled "Eaten Alive." Okay, I, 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 I'm sorry. I was unprepared for this. Oh, uh, all right, all right. So let, let's just read this real quick. This is from uh, uh, some syndicate, right? Yeah, Cle- Cle- uh, uh, Cleveland uh, uh, dot com. Uh, uh, so here we go. Naturalist Paul Rosalie uh, has been dubbed the Indiana Jones of the Amazon, but there's one key difference between him and Indy. Rosalie isn't afraid of snakes. Uh, At 26, Rosalie has created a snake-proof suit and allowed himself to be eaten alive by a massive anaconda for an upcoming Discovery Channel TV special aptly titled Eaten Alive. The special will air December 7th, and the extreme stunt has already drawn its fair share of criticism and skepticism. Yeah, so, so this is implying that it's already happened. Like he's already. I've been there, man. Yeah, I've been inside the belly of a boy. You want to get you want to get laid? You head out to a bar and say, "I've seen everything, man." Oh my God! According to Entertainment Weekly, Rosalie will be covered in pig's blood to make the snake hungry. That was my next question. Was was there's nothing about this uh, vaguely Iron Man like suit that uh, that 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 seems appetizing to an anaconda? Uh, so so I uh, pig's blood, delicious. Well, no, but that means that they can't. All right, so so we're assuming that this is already shot, right? Yeah. Yes. This is not going to be a live special. Uh, and if that's the case, the snake can't die at the end. <sighs> like, or else it wouldn't air. How do you... How do you get... Uh, um, okay, now keep in mind, though, like, uh, there's been a number of specials 
especially like live specials or event specials. Like I remember tuning in. It was the late 90s and Evil Knievel's son was going to jump over a piece of the Grand Canyon. It was prime time television. And he sat there with his motorcycle standing in the drizzle of the rain. And for an hour, we all watched clips before finally he shook his head and said, nope, too wet. <laughs> And, now, and then they came back eight months later and did the exact same special, only this time he jumped across. Uh, I mean, it could, could it be one of those things where it's like they just they just sell it and build on up and maybe they don't have them, you know, from inside the belly of the beast. But it was like, but we did put this tiny thumb-sized, uh, you know, camera inside and this is what he would have seen. I'm, I'm betting that it's happened. Uh, but uh, Ike, listen, let me, let me make my policy on snakes very clear. Yeah. Um, I know some people have pet snakes. They love their pet snakes. Your snake does not care about you. Your snake does not love you. The snake is not capable of love. It may curl up next to you because you're effing warm. It'll do the same thing with a hot rock, okay? Snakes are reptiles. They're totally indifferent to you. They do not love you. They do not have maternal instincts. Mama snakes and little baby snakes don't hang out, okay? That being said, don't torture a snake like this, <laughs> you know? Let's. It's a snake. I mean, give it some respect. Come on. I mean, I'm all for snake hunts in the Everglades and killing those invasive little bastards. I don't want them to suffer. There's you know? there's no way he actually uh, number there, there there's no way he gets swallowed by it because um, here's what we know. We know that they're airing it. Uh, we know that um, uh, that they're airing it. <laughs> <laughs> Which means there's things that they won't be doing. They won't be killing the well, snake. I, there's there's fifty fifty shot. This doesn't make air. Oh no well, no no! I I guarantee well, you that's like, the big secret. Assuming is... that it plays out the way they say it's going to play out, the snake swallows him and then they pull him back out. Yeah no, it won't go down like that. They will say that is the stated goal. Uh, they will spend an hour. They'll throw cameras in the snake. And you'll actually see, like, now we're in the snake's butthole coming out at the end. Oh, my God. And then uh, and then they're all like, yeah, man, I'm totally going to get eaten by a snake. And then pour him in the pig's blood. And then it's like you, we get some great scene of him wrestling or whatever. But then at the end, he walks off of the sunset. He's like, I guess the snake doesn't like people after all. So be good to snakes. Uh, no, I totally disagree, Brian, because I feel like this is – they're watching that, that Nick Walenda – like what you thought it was, they're watching those ratings and they're like, guess what? People doing buck wild stuff that's like really dangerous is in. So we need to get into that game on these like hour long specials that generate a lot of hype. I think. And then they're like, all right, so who can do some crazy stuff that might get them killed? And they get all these resumes of like, I can swallow a blender and like <laughs> I can uh, jump off the moon and I can do blah, blah, blah. Full, and full disclosure here. Um, I actually had a project under development and discovery that was a crazy, stupid sort of thing involving wildlife. That's all I can get say. So uh, I, I, I think I not it. snakes, bro. <laughs> but all of a sudden they get one from this dude that crosses their desk. And I'm sure he's a fairly, you know, uh, a, a, a TV handsome enough guy. He's 26. He says, I can do this crazy thing with a snake. And they say, great, here's some money. Let's all go down to Brazil and let's shoot you get in this snake thing and we'll see what happens. And I guarantee you that they delivered, he delivered, OP surely delivered. And that is what we will see. The question is whether or not it makes air because they are getting, they're going to get pounded by animal activists. Here's, here's the thing. If that's the case, if they had that footage um, then, then I don't think they would play coy with it because they're playing coy and keeping stuff secret or whatever. I, I feel like, like you'll notice the, the wiggle words where they're all like, you know, presumably, uh, he's claims he's going to, we'll see. I, 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 I don't know, but that's not the, that's not the, 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 the PR release that they're rewriting. That's right? true. Like that's, that's true. That's, uh, we should we should actually see what they're claiming it's going to be, but I I just uh, my, my my gut says that they're 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 too savvy to uh, to to uh, I don't know I'm, I'm not gonna I'm gonna stop talking. All right, so <laughs> we'll, we'll speak into wildly. that. I have one more story, and then we'll get into the real heart of what this episode's about. And this is a good lead-in. Yeah. Oh, well, which by the way, two days ago, Peta already has you know is is criticizing it and, and blasting it for animal cruelty and everything. I don't think that this makes air. I, I I don't think it is that. I think it's a trick. It, this smells like a a switcheroo on me. It's it uh, to me. It's, we'll 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 find out. We'll see. Meanwhile, meanwhile, 
Um, this is something that I just sent out on the weird list. What? And it, What's this weird list, and how can I get on it? The weird list, Brian, is a list of weird things, of things that are weird that get put into a list. Oh gosh, so like if I were to go to patreon.com slash weird things, could I possibly uh, donate enough that I could get on your secret list where you send out links to stuff that you don't put on your public social media feeds? Yeah, I like what I just said. Uh, okay, right on. <laughs> so, uh, uh, by the way, uh, uh, patreon.com slash weird things. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, almost so 300 of you now. What, uh, uh, what I found was really fascinating, we've talked before about the idea of rogue planets. These are planets that don't have a parent star that just drift through space between solar systems. And there may be more rogue planets than there are actually planets in solar systems, which if you think about – and a rogue planet doesn't have to be like a completely dead icy world. A rogue planet could have a molten core. It could have ice on the surface. It could even have liquid water. It could have some of the things necessary for life to develop. And it could have started off around a star then had been ejected. So we could have between us and our nearest stars – there could be hundreds of rogue planets drifting there. And as we talk about space exploration, we might hip hop or hop rather from one <laughs> planet to the next. <laughs> hey, everybody, have you heard Hippity the news? hop. I'm sorry. I'm to use the scientific term, okay? Go straight up gangster to thuggin from rogue planet to rogue planet. Hippity hop, sir, please. <laughs> so that could be, you know, so that, I love that idea. I love this notion that the, the universe, our galaxy, isn't just. Solar system, solar system, solar system, but there could be planets between drifting apart. Is that now comes? Oh, oh yeah, re, re, real quick, like um, I I know that um that that we are scientists are a bit uh, flummoxed, a bit uh, confused by the the motion of galaxies, and that the the that's why they introduce uh, you look at the equations, and so it's like well, there's got to be dark matter or dark energy that's causing these things to move this way, like, like how, could rogue planets account for a significant portion of no, that? Or that's got to no. be a totally different thing. Totally different. Totally no, different. No. Totally. This is, this is oh. just dust. It's dumb, Brian. It's dumb. <laughs> dumb. <laughs> and, and the big thing is really the dark energy thing is really like, like that's what like 97% of everything is, is this stuff we can't account for. Got no, it. it's totally different. But there is a background sort of glow <laughs> that scientists were trying to figure out, right? This, this glow in the galaxy, this extra galactic background light, which I don't know if you've noticed, I've noticed this too when I go outside. I'm like, where is this glow coming from, guys? <laughs> What's up with it? I just feel like uh, like not all of this is fusion energy around me. I don't know, maybe that's just me. No, actually it is fusion, Brian. But what it is, is they now think half of all stars in the universe may be rogues that don't belong on galaxies, that they're floating in between galaxies. Wait a minute. Uh, wait, so so st rogue stars? Wait, I, I, rogue stars between galaxies. Rogue planets would be between stars in our own galaxy or oh, other galaxies. Wow. These are stars drifting, not on the Milky Way, not Andromeda, not in a local group that are just drifting apart by themselves. I mean, that would make sense, right? You would think that, but in order to, because a, a galaxy is is a coalescing of uh, essentially, like if you, th and I'm sure this is eight million times wrong. Like you picture, you look, you look at smoke, and it's like you know that's all particulates or whatever. But picture gravity kind of collapsing and swirling stuff in, just like you, you know, planetary or, or dust eventually coalesces into planets. And so, yeah, no, it makes sense. Why not? Yeah. So scientists using the piece of equipment that we'll never remember what it's called, doing an experiment of which I couldn't describe, have decided that it may be because. There are these stars. And that, so you think about it, you could have around these stars planets. So you could have people, civilizations, life, all that, living on planets around orbiting stars that aren't part of a galaxy, and their night sky would be very, very dark. Oh, my gosh. I guess so. Because, like, right now, Andromeda is our closest neighbor galaxy. It's one of, like, uh, do we know how many galaxies you can see with the naked eye? Uh... Let's uh, ask, let's ask Wolfram Alpha. Wow. <laughs> no. Let me let's Google how many galaxies his naked eye. Oh, I just got porn. Uh, can any galaxies be seen? Uh, uh, there are four that I can think of: the Milky Way, the Magellanic Clouds, and Andromeda. Oh my God! So think about that in the entire night sky. You've got, you know, our galaxy and our stars, but picture none of those are nearby. Yeah, and by the way, you know, Andromeda's not the closest galaxy. Um, 
there are satellite galaxies and stuff, and so you have you have MG seven MGC one, which is a cluster. Um, and then you have like Bernard, like you do have, when you start talking about like satellite galaxies, you have Bernard's galaxy, the Phoenix dwarf galaxy, the Fornax dwarf galaxy, which is closer than, that's when we talk about Milky Way, we talk about the local group, which is a local cluster of galaxies. Okay. Got it. Uh, man, I didn't even think about how dark that is because to me, when you talk about number of galaxies, I immediately just think of, of, of the, the Hubble deep space field, right? Where they, they pointed the Hubble to what looked like a pitch dark part and it's just utterly awash with, with so many galaxies you can't even count them, except they totally do count them. Uh, I, I didn't even think about how dark that, that world is. But here's the weird part is in all likelihood... I mean, we're never going to go to any of these other galaxies. Speak for yourself. Might not. <laughs> how, how would we ever go to another galaxy? There's, is, is, there, is there any conceivable, uh, plausible uh, futurist method yeah, for going to Yeah, we never another... die, and we advance to the point where we can get to other galaxies. Yeah, I guess so. But again, that's going to be robots. That's our children. That's not us. Or maybe it's our brains or our consciousness downloaded into robots. Okay, fine. That's the only way we're going. But this this crude Brian has declared it law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess here's my point: is we... thousand years from now, some brilliant kids are had this this warp drive engine that we would think is impossible. Should we turn it on? No. Brian has declared <laughs> it. has law. decreed <laughs> that it will not. No be. man shall ever. <laughs> And thus it was spoken by Brushwood's edict <laughs> in four episodes into the great Patreon age <laughs> on the weird things podcast. Brian oh, was not the he man. <laughs> no, I guess here's my point is we look out at the stars and we are blown away by this uncountably inf uh, infinite, you know, uh, influx of light. And we perceive all of them as neighbors and there's times we wonder, like, we don't know where they are, but we think that there's other intelligent life out there. A lot of us do. Um, but the funny part is, in all likelihood, by the numbers, uh, it's extremely unlikely that we will ever physically meet another one of those, unless we create it, unless we're the ones who go out there and seed among the stars and spread. Um, the, this, These poor, <laughs> intelligent versions of us on this rogue planet orbiting this rogue star... I mean, they're they're really let's say let's say they eventually build telescopes because they want to inspect the one dot of light for 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 whatever reason, and then they discover all that other stuff. I I, I don't know. It just seems like 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 we've grown up looking at stars yeah. and people theorizing that they're other suns. So but they build a telescope and they look at this one one or two hazy little dots, right? You know that are far far off, and they imagine them to be these lonely, lonely, lonely places like them. And they look through there and they see there a big cluster of stars, a big cluster of stars. They're like, "How come those jerks got friends?" Well, that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Like, imagine like we grew up with the friendliness of the stars, or you know, for thousands yeah, of years. Yeah, like, right. imagine them going zero to holy crap, they're everywhere. You know. But but here, but not here. We are at the ass end of the universe. Nobody <laughs> likes us. And we're like, yeah, 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 man. You got one planet. What? Do we, you'd feel so gypped. You're like, we got one star, one yeah. planet. We don't have you. We don't even have a moon. <laughs> the upside is that one of the things they think that causes regular extinctions might be some like you know galactic emitter of some high energy radiation that periodically like sterilizes the planet or wipes away a lot good portion of life on it. Less likely to have that out there. Do you think that that would increase? The likelihood of, uh, I guess, uh, oh, I don't know, like, um, a, 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 have you ever seen the the graphic of the perfect Sim City? Uh, city, mm -hmm. somebody somebody played Sim City 2000 so much that he he figured out this absolutely perfect, most efficient, maximum efficient layout of everything. It's like this hex grid thing. Uh, somebody will send a link in the chat, I'm sure, in no time. But uh, but basically, you look at it. And it's like he just starts playing and he builds and he covers the entire map. It's perfectly uniform. It's perfectly efficient. And it covers everything. For some reason, like if you got nothing else going on out there and you're just your own one planet, one star, nothing in the sky around, it seems like that would be kind of like your destiny is to eventually do that. And I, I don't know. Like and then now I want to picture like, you know, becomes a, a planet-sized consciousness. Now, here's the thing to think about. So I'm doing a little research here. Andromeda, which we think of like the nearest big spiral galaxy, is 2.5 million light years away, right? 
But within the local group of which Andromeda's part, there are other little smaller galaxies that are much, much closer. Andromeda's got like a trillion stars, 25 million or 2.5 million light years away. Canis Major Overdensity. It's a disputed dwarf or regular galaxy located in the same part as Constellation Major. Uh, some debate over it, but it's 28,000 light years away. That's, uh, that's, that seems doable. Little, yeah. little hypersleep, little mm -hmm. disco nap. Wake yeah. up in another galaxy. Yeah. Uh, man, that's fascinating. To and and the biggest part. And did you did I hear you right? Did you say that 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 it's theorized that there are more of these rogue stars? stars? About half. They say maybe half of the stars in the universe could be rogue stars. Holy cow! Which is the name of my band, Rogue Star. By the rogue way. Star. <laughs> smoking a cigarette, driving off, giving the middle finger while a cast and crew is like, hey, man, are we going to shoot this or what? <laughs> like, our bass player wears, like, a Greedo costume. <laughs> it's, uh, it's Rogue Star. Rogue so, Star. So, gentlemen, I say we do picks, and then I say we dive into, or we we forgo picks to do one pick, and then we'd go into a discussion, a spoiler-heavy discussion. Yeah, I, I, I think we can kind of skip picks. The only thing that I've watched uh, recently is Trailer Park Boys. I've just been plowing through Trailer Park Boys. This is a Canadian uh, uh, hilarity fest. Um, that's it. It's on Netflix. So I, I don't know if anyone else brought anything that they wanted to share. I mean, I, I, I have a, a weird uh, documentary cult pick, which is called The Source. It's about this, this organic food restaurant out here in L.A. that started like in the 60s or 70s and became a cult. And it's a pretty interesting documentary because throughout the documentary, they play the music that they made. Oh, my God. <laughs> this, the source is a good place to get some food. <laughs> it's horrible. Music is horrible. Oh, my God. So is my, it, uh, okay. The source. My favorite part, the guy who heads the cult, it's kind of like this big Santa Claus looking guy. They show him at Beverly Hills High School. They're playing music. This is like in 1970s. They're kind of trying to recruit like they call me father. I think you might need a father too, and so and he's playing drums as they're kind of grooving out. Um, I would like I would like to point out model. that it's listed, uh, its categories listed as mystery slash musical, <laughs> the source on IMDb. So yeah, yeah. Um, I, um, all right, I'm I'm in. God, I love I love I love uh, watching documentaries. It's on Netflix. Netflix. All right, uh, Justin. So uh, I, I think really it needs to be mentioned um, that there's a video out there that is a true achievement. Uh, that is something that that needs to not only be watched but studied and understood uh, for years to come, decades, generations, uh, long after Brushwood's Law uh, has come and gone, <laughs> and and it is our kids' kids who are taking. Uh, them themselves across to different uh, adjoining galaxies, they will all say. <laughs> so, did you watch too many cooks yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, it, 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 let me, if you have not seen too many cooks, let me place you in my frame of mind. When I first heard people talking about too many cooks, I'm like, eh. All right, 11 minutes in. It's like, so it's like a show open that goes on. Is that it? Really? That's the joke. Um, <laughs> Boy, what a fool I am. Uh, <laughs> it is a very, very multi-layered thing. There is a narrative there that you have to watch it multiple times to fully pick up upon what's going on. It is fascinating when you think about all the details. And if you remember watching shows like Small Wonder and other things, you see the elements they picked up upon. But it's it's a... It, it it passes. Hello, Katie Grant. <laughs> it, it passes the Andrew test, and that there is a clear conflict going on. Yeah, and there is a resolution. And Smarf is my hero. Uh, he's a hero to all mankind. He, um, uh, if I heard right, they spent like a year and a half working on this for an eleven-minute short just to be run. Uh, it was about a year ago that they shot all. They shot uh, it in two days. Yeah. Yeah. And it, but and musically, they, it just took time and just, you know, yeah. But yeah, it was done a year ago. It, it's, it, it's what makes it kind of amazing and, and really, really special is that if, if, you know, everybody kind of has these same descriptions of watching it where it's like, I was about to turn it off and then. For 11 it, minutes straight. 
And oh yeah, then I, I was, was kind I of- was, yeah, I was like the minute two minutes, I'm like, all right, I get the joke, and I'm ready to fast forward, and then, oh wait a second, <laughs> oh, and then what they do, what's brilliant is, uh, is that once you get the joke, the joke keeps changing, changing, changing faster and faster, which is really, really smart. Yeah. yeah. It's it's like a, when you watch these kinds of things, you, you normally have the advantage of hindsight in that it's almost impossible for them to move faster than you can figure out where stuff's headed. And that a yeah. lot of movies are this way. Whereas this one, um, man, they don't care, man. They just keep on moving. And then it's like they set so that up be like, oh, they're going to take us on a tour of this kind of thing. And then it's like, nope, drop that. We did that once, twice. Now we're done. Well, just, just the tone of it where it's like, oh, well, here we're doing referential comedy. And now we're doing genre parody. And now we're doing the slapstick. And now we're doing... Uh, bizarre subversive stuff and now we're just doing something dark and weird and it's not funny and it's brutal and it's like disturbing and then we're gonna do something really slapsticky right afterward like it, it's it's it really is something that I, I uh, you know with, without getting you know uh, there's nothing less interesting than people getting serious about something funny but like it's incredibly well constructed and if you care about jokes and comedy like you just need to watch it and understand why it's good yep so there we go all right spoiler alert spoilers spoilers will be spoiled spoil 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 and we're spoiling interstellar if you've not watched interstellar yet stop it stop it right now uh real quick before we move on i just want to say a special thanks to uh, chimera who uh Made of Brian Brushwood um, frame from Too Many Cooks. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. All right. You're they're ready? muted. People are muted. They're running away. Talking about All right, Interstellar. So now you know. Well, this will be the end of the show, right? I think, like, for anybody, if, if you are listening. Weird things. It's been weird. Blah, blah, blah. Boom. There you go. All right. Patreon.com slash weird things. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Uh, okay, so w- when did you see it? I saw it uh, what Thursday, Thursday night with uh, with Penny. I took my daughter, um, which was uh, uh, it, it was kind of a weird thing for me because you know Penelope uh, really like she would make a fantastic hypnosis subject because she just feels so deeply. You see her when she watches TV; she gets you know so sucked into it that you know this being a PG thirteen movie and knowing that it's going to be about a dad who abandons and uh, who leaves his daughter uh, because the universe needs him. Uh, I figured like, well, we'll see how this goes. And, uh, she, uh, she, she, so I saw it on Thursday. What about you guys? Wait, hold on. Wait, did, how did she handle it? Oh, well, I, I didn't want to jump the line. I wanted to just check. I, I mean, I'll tell you, she, she, uh, I sort of warned her going into it. I was like, Hey man, this is science fiction. She's like, like guardians of the galaxy. And I'm like, Ethnicon is kind of like a raccoon. Well, I, I, you know, I, I explained to her that there could be a genre that she hasn't really experienced called dramatic st- st- storytelling. You know, d- just drama. And 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 I was like, look, I ain't gonna lie, you'll probably end up crying at, during part of this. But you know, there's parts that you get choked up during Guardians of the Galaxy too. It's just more of that. And there'll be there'll be moments where you smile or laugh or whatever. Man, my dad never coached anything like that for me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he just threw you to the wolves. You Terminator when I'm 10 years old, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, called Dog Day Afternoon. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, she she handled it. Oh, my God. She she bawled so loud that I knew the whole theater was, was lit because we were in the front row, and there's Penelope audibly going. <laughs> <laughs> sure that wasn't her dad? <laughs> Your dad knows how to silently cry for three hours straight watching this movie. Like a man. Yeah. I saw it Tuesday night in LA they, at Hollywood. They have a theater here called the Arclight, which is really nice. They have a thing called the Dome, which is big, huge, like, cinematic dome. So they had a 70 millimeter print. Uh, so they did early screenings in certain places like that. So I got in there. I had my little front row seats. Um... I will say this, uh, the Slash Film had a thing talking about audio problems in some theaters. I totally I, experienced it in mine. Totally. I did not at all. I, I didn't even understand what they were talking about. Everything was, I mean, it was loud, but 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 I understood everything. So like the blast off when he's talking to the robots, you could not hear the jokes. 
Oh, no. Yeah, I could totally hear yeah. all that stuff. So, and that was, and I don't know if that was the thing. Like, did you see it digitally or did you see it? Uh, I saw digital. I did not and see. And that might be the problem because it looks like it was like, from, from what I'm seeing, it looks like the film prints are the ones that have the problem. And uh. I know Nolan loves film, but like my, my audio experience in that was frustrating. It was absolutely, it was, I was a little bit angry. Because, you know, I paid extra to go see it the day early and the best possible experience is Nolan wanted and the audio was so crappy. And it was that happened also with the like the the TLC, the Chinese theater across the street. Audio was problematic there. And so I know that's been an issue. But aside from that, we'll 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 move past that. Oh, what a bummer. That's that's too bad because like what a what a technical foul to get dinged on <laughs> for Yeah, I don't know whether or not it uh it it was an audio problem, but I definitely there were there were certain points where where Matthew McConaughey I, I kind of wanted subtitles just for his McConaughey ness. Like <laughs> I, sometimes he he tends to to run his stuff together. So that aside, what do we think about the movie? I mean, I'll go ahead and say um, uh, I I loved it. Um, I guess here's the thing, I I don't put it in the same category as Inception or any even other Christopher Nolan film. To me, from the beginning, this felt like a good science fiction novel. And I've read I've read some good science fiction novels. I've read some some less good science fiction novels. And, you know, I've learned I've just read enough science fiction that I know to be patient with long, lumbering, meandering plots because somebody has a really cool idea of what uh, relativity would mean in this particular context. And he wants to get it out. Um uh, uh, not that it was long or rambly or whatever, but it reminded me so very much of uh, uh, Haldeman's book, The Forever War. Have you ever read that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's a book about a dude who goes to war, and uh, you know, war is very far away, so they have to send you at nearly the light speed. Goes and fights in the war. Almost everyone dies but him. Comes back. Uh, it's only been a few years for him. A thousand years have passed and like giant sweeping cultural changes have happened. Uh, homosexuality becomes the norm for population control. And he's Finally. like, he's I mean, like, what? yeah, he's like the weirdo. What a crazy idea. <laughs> he's like the weirdo for liking women. And, uh, and then, you know, and then he leaves again to fight another war. And, uh, again, a lot of people die. So he comes back. And, uh, and then it's been another thousand years, another giant sweeping cultural change. And it's like, you know, he's becoming thousands of years old and, and the, you know, he comes back and nobody Which cares. doesn't who. happen here to that extent, just to be clear. No, 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 correct. But, but, uh, but it was a book that, um, uh, that I really liked. And this echoed so many of those horrifying problems, the, the reality of space travel. I mean, there's, there's a reason that I say it's not going to be us going. It's going to be our children because I don't yeah. think uh, – that that we can we can handle. yeah i i from a science point of view i thoroughly thought the science part of it was great and i've heard some criticism that have actually are kind of like bs criticisms because things that were stated in there like oh and it was actually smarter than a lot of people one prominent science writer actually had to retract his statements because it turned out he did his math wrong and it was smarter than he gave him credit for and so i had i had no problem with the science at all um i think that uh you know, and they, they kind of say they qualify it's they call it like a you know a, a, a matured black hole or the way it behaves differently. And so they qualified everything I thought very well. The grand thesis I th I saw I read IO9 didn't get it in my opinion. We're like, oh, and then the idea that love is the is the final part of the equation they didn't like. That wasn't what it was. No. It was that love was this magical power that united science. Love was the thing that gave us a reason to go out and do science and to explore and to go do all of that. Well, and also in that moment where, you, you know, and he does do that kind of like flatly stating the thesis while he's inside the singularity or whatever. He's like, what do you know? Was Love was whatever. That's that's not the point. That no. was like a coincidental observation like oh my god she said that and i blew her off but here it is you can make a case that that's what's happening well, right now but, but and she and was wrong that's, too because her what's that justin it's it's the reason why the movie for whatever you think of it we can parse it as a movie that is worth being parsed because matthew mcconaughey is the beating charismatic heart of an otherwise fairly uh a sterile you know, we need to go to space and cut off our passions so we can further the human race. And, and that tend that, that, that becomes our central thematic conflict is, you know, uh, caring for other people versus you know, the people you leave, you are leaving behind versus the people that will theoretically be because of the actions that we take. 
Uh, and so it's like he is a messy character uh, and, and that's what makes him a compelling, makes the movie watchable at that at that length. I mean, it, it's amazing that 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 movie like doesn't feel draggy. Not like, at all. There's moments in, in in Inception, which I think is a far better movie, that I felt dragged more than than this movie, which is like about sitting in a space in, in a in a spaceship, going years and years and and uh, you know away from home. So. Uh, I think that bo- that did not bother me. The the end. I mean, I guess that we we should. I don't know. I don't know where we want to start this conversation, but the end. I think needs its own kind of dialogue. Yeah, I I, I and I would say too. Like, I'll give a point. Like, sort of like I've heard some crit of like, oh well, the idea of like love being this magic science ingredient thing, and that's not what that's not what I took away from the movie because Anne Hathaway's speech. She's like, I know he's there. I can tell because I love him. She's talking about her, you know, the astronaut she's in love with. We see her burying a body. She was wrong. There was that was an imaginary connection, and that's what this really was. It was the idea about, you know, that. And I honestly, Tinsor guy, I don't, I don't have a problem with fuel at all. I don't. I think they made a very clear case of how much fuel they had to do things with, and the idea of when the endeavor or the you know whatever the that would be at one point, whatever. I don't think they violated their logic on that. Well, I could be well, mistaken. Yeah, you might be able to turn me around on this. I felt like there are some big, bitter pills you got to swallow to go on the ride on this one. The biggest one is that you have to buy the idea that humanity would just lose its pioneering spirit, which just seems absolutely I, I, insane to me. But, but I don't, I don't, but Brian, like, you know, you had millions of Russians in the Soviet era embark upon horrific agricultural practices and bring themselves to the brink of starvation as did the Chinese did. You had almost half the planet that did that, you know, and, and I, and as a whole, yeah, but what happens to the people who have the guns? You know, they talk about the idea that, you know, that you have, that NASA was asked to bomb people from space and they did not want to do that. So there was some sort of political struggle and the people in charge are now the ones who are censoring textbooks could put in like, could happen before. We've had this happen before where you have this, imagine this was took place in 1930s Russia and there was, you know, the Dust Bowl happened there. Yeah. And and it seems like, like the, it's not that humanity has lost its adventuring spirit. It's that humanity is in shock because all of this has happened very quickly and reshaped society very quickly. And, that this is, I mean, it, it feels because they, they never really get specific on exactly when stuff happened and where we are in in the course of of everything. Although, uh, I, it's supposed to be, I guess, modern day, right? Because they look at the mission that was launched ten years ago and it says oh four on it. Although it might be, you know, twenty one oh four, yeah, thirty, yeah, three thousand fourteen or whatever. Anyway, uh, it it felt to me like like it was a traumatized society and not necessarily a society that was broken and that Matthew McConaughey's crazy Matthew McConaughey-ness embodies the like no we just we gotta we gotta survive we have to continue to you know traverse the ocean and and you know sail the stars uh so the uh, the other thing is you know it's uh, there's a lot of unspecified stuff they never really go into the blight or even like you mentioned specifically say what 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 year it is and again I I loved all of that um the biggest surprise to me was the transformation of thinking the robots were so cheesy to so awesome oh, yeah like like that was amazing I was like this is the dumbest robot I've ever seen I'm like these are the best robots I've ever seen. I was so like at the end of the movie. I, again, I'm listening it once. I want to. I was very conflicted. There was a lot I loved, a lot I didn't love. There was a lot of things that I, I thought that the way the story was unfolded or told, I had a lot of issues with, and I wasn't very happy with. But there, I started thinking of all the little bits that I like. I loved the robots. I loved that. I loved the themes. I love, love, love the themes of this movie. Absolutely love the themes. Okay, so so sell me on they're this very, one as well. They're very weird things, friendly, right? Like this is yeah. this is the themes for which dominate this film are. I don't no matter how much people are telling you you're crazy and have very very good reasons why we shouldn't do x y or z the thing we need to do is leave go explore you know you know embrace our destiny as the the galaxy's explorers 
So sell me on this one, because another thing that drove me nuts watching it was I didn't understand how they had the technology to go. And I guess relativity, I understand that 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 there's only like a you know like a periscope, you're only able to get a ping through from time to time, uh, and that there are uh, you know there's the scenario where they get tricked by the one planet or whatever. But the fact that they would be orbiting the planet, that they would be arriving on the water world and not be able to just run a scan and look and see that there's no land and that it's all just giant tidal waves running in circles. Like that, that just, that was a little, again, again, happy to pay that price uh, for admission in order to, to, to go on this ride. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know how close they were able to get to that before they'd be able to do their, their scans or what their scans would tell them or whatever the idea that they needed less than ambiguous information. And, and now ultimately it serves the purpose of the story, the idea that they have to, but the idea is that they sent these astronauts to actually go to the ground on there. And you think about how little do we know about Mars right now? Right. You know, and, and we know we we've had we've been able to spend far more resources on trying to understand what's going on Mars. We don't know if six inches knee underneath the surface of Mars, Mars, of Mars of Mars, if Mars. there's microbes, you know. Well, and um, also, Brian, like so in the in the context of the story, they are getting feedback or they have gotten every every time that they've gotten feedback from that planet. It was. Yep. Totally awesome. Things are great. Well, and then well, you get down uh, there. Yeah, uh, and and you are in orbit, and it says, "Wow, it looks like there's all this water down there." Well, we've just completely come across the galaxy, and we're five feet, and all of our information says that he's down there. So even if it's if it looks like hell, he's survived. Like we should, we need to at least go down there and find out what it is, you know, and and get him. Right. Well, and I guess you could make a case where it's like, you know, this is a story of limited resources and, and, and time is the most valuable resource of all. So it's like, well, screw it. You know, I'm not going to look at the, uh, the the map or the telescope and just see if there's land or whatever. But presumably they land there knowing that there there, there would be three feet of water. Um, so you would think that well, they would know whether or not those were We don't know that mountains. there wasn't land there, too. I mean, that, that, that where they landed, obviously, it, there was it was very shallow. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, okay. Regardless, I don't want to. I don't want to be one of those guys that nitpicks. I'm just saying, like those were the things like that I just noticed, and 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 I didn't mind them at all in order to get the rest of the the the, uh, the story out of there. Uh, I thought all of the human stuff was amazing. I thought the plot device of him d- jumping down, getting three hours done on that planet, getting the hell out, and then having to sit there and agonizingly watch his kid grow up and eventually let go of him. Um, it was great. Just a faucet. Well, and that's the thing is, is it's, it, it is this very odd duality of a, a very, the, I think Brian, you kind of hit on it, like a, a science fiction novel kind of conceit with these elements of, you know, in, in many ways, Nolan at, uh, you know, with his best tendencies of understanding where the emotional kind of core of, of where these these characters well at least Makane. I, I don't really know if we really found the emotional core of anybody else but you know Makane's relationship toward his daughter his daughter because yeah. I don't really know if we you know have a great idea of what her view toward him was you know uh, I mean, beyond anything that just was there to serve the plot yes I agree completely all you know you get a vague sense that she spent a long time being angry and eventually forgave him and started maybe dating Topher Grace? Uh, oh, yeah. Speaking of which, can we talk about the surprise celebrities that were in this? <laughs> like, all of a sudden, a coffin opens, and it's Matt Damon? I'm like, wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. What? <laughs> well, that's as soon as they're like, they're like, oh, and then there was Professor Mann. You know, right over there. And they point to a picture that you can't see because it's too far away. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's going to be a celebrity. And then we get to, you know, uh, door number two. And uh, it's like, well, let's open Celebrity Coffin. <laughs> Matt Damon's here. Yay. I, I didn't see it coming at all, and I didn't even I didn't expect it. I, I remember reading that he was in it for something, and then it was nothing more about it, and I totally forgot until he popped out. Yeah, how about that That looming, you know, it's and it's like it's fairly clear, you know, if you're familiar with, you know, 3X structures or whatever, that is like, this, this guy's probably not everything he seems to be. But yeah. it's like you still felt – this kind of like looming chokingness as they wandered off farther and farther together. I, I dug that. Yeah, I, for me, it was the moment he pops out and he acts weird. You're like, oh, it was like, oh, he, he BS'd the data. This is, he's, this is, he just wanted them to come get it. And so that part, that part of the movie became kind of boring for me because I'm like, 
I have to wait for them to get, you know, this, this situation, I have to wait for them to get off the planet, and I'm more excited about the next planet. So, and that was an Andrewism, I know. No, that's, I mean, but that, but you, you look, you're a precog. We all know this. When it comes to story, you have a, you have a gift. I didn't, Andrew. I didn't notice the whole look over. I remember they showed one guy. I'm like, well, who's he, you know? But I didn't realize that I didn't, didn't see that he was coming. But once his character was introduced, it's like, you know, cause it's all the cagey things. He's like, he was so, so emotionally like, oh, thank God that like, this is a guy that would do anything to get them there. And then like, oh, mind if we fix your robot? Uh, no, needs a human touch. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that, that, that was a bit thick. Um, the, I'll tell you I, what, the, I, I thought, I thought he did a great job. Like I thought it, it was, okay, it was, yeah. it was a great acting performance by him because, you know, he has T minus, you know, what, 15 minutes, 20 minutes of screen time to go from, you know, the greatest hope humanity has ever known. And, and somebody for, for whom we are described as the best of us and the best that humanity, the bravest man in the history of the planet, of the human species, to somebody that we are really excited to have suddenly die. <laughs> like, well, I'll tell you this much. Like, like even though he played a bad guy and a weak character, sold me on if the rumors, if he's, you know, last I heard, he was rumored to be doing Rid with Ridley Scott to do The Martian, uh, in which case I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. I think he can sell it. Um, the uh, uh, that moment when he dies, I just felt ill. Like I just like they're so screwed. There's no, you know, they, like you get a very powerful sense of just how estranged from the rest of humanity they are at that moment, and to see that severe destruction, you're like, there's no coming back from this. That's it. They they die on the other side of the of, of the galaxy. Yeah. Spoiler it, alert. Let's, <laughs> let's get to the ending. Because the ending, I feel, as soon as we got to the ending, and I liked it, I, I enjoyed, the, I enjoyed the movie. I think I had, I had, I'm somewhere between Brian and and Andrew in terms of of where I would rate it if it were on a numerical scale. Although Brian, I think, for you to see it with your daughter around the age that the Murph character is, <laughs> and she's into science, like. It's kind of, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's like, worth, it's like, well, it's a different experience, man. I saw it in 3D IMAX with daughter vision and uh, I really got a sense of what it's like to be Matthew McConaughey. Uh, you, I want to, I want to ask you guys without looking, without looking, where would you think the Rotten Tomatoes, not the critic, but the audience score, where would you say this ranks from between Gravity, Avatar, Contact in 2001? Um... Higher than contact. I'm going to say contact is the lowest. I'm going to say 2001 is also on the lower end. I'm going to put this. Mm, Gravity had some haters. I'm going to put this right below Gravity. And what was the other one? Avatar. Oh, av Avatar has got to be like number one out of those. It wouldn't. Yeah, I would think it's number two. It's number two to Avatar, I would guess. All right, are you ready? Yeah, and this is not critics reviews. This is audience reviews. Audience, audience okay. reviews, and, and it's a good indicator of how will this thing be remembered and received. All right, of those films, the one with the lowest audience score, the lowest audience score, is Contact, at seventy eight percent. Yeah, I liked Contact a lot, by the way. The second lowest is Gravity. What? At eighty-one percent audience score, which still very good. Immediately after that is Avatar at eighty-two percent. Holy cow! Which hmm. leaves us with two movies. So it's got to it's got to be lower than two thousand one, right? But then again, two thousand one has a lot of like people just don't like. I don't get it. Probably have fewer people voting on it too. So yeah. so right now. Uh, Interstellar has 83,000 user ratings. 2001 has 290,000. So that's quite a lot of user ratings all of a sudden. Statistically significant. Yes. Yeah, okay. 2001 a Space, Audience, Space Odyssey has an 89% user liked it. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready now? I'm ready. I'm ready. Or Interstellar? 88. Correct, sir. No. Oh, yes. 88%. Uh, so it's funny that you mentioned 2001 because I feel like the criticisms... I don't understand the criticisms. I, I don't understand. I didn't understand them uh, uh, about gravity. Um, you know, it's like like in the, 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 the great Andrew Main pointed out, you know, you want to point out problems with gravity? How about the fact that we don't actually have a shuttle program anymore? That's a, that's a pretty big flaw. 
Um, you know, it's I don't, especially Interstellar, where it's clearly not our world. It's clearly not this. <laughs> this movie clearly takes place in an alternate reality from well, Earth. It took place in alternate reality, but but well, no, I mean it's not our actual planet Earth because it's a made-up movie. Like you can say that about any work of fiction. It takes place in an alternate reality where a woman has to make a choice between no, it's two like, boyfriends. In the prologue, Matthew McConaughey changes his name to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh. actor Matthew McConaughey uh, <laughs> yes. destroyed. By what's happened to um, his world, get, like, besides to become a farmer. You know, there's, there's been the nerd reaction to the movie where every, every, every nerd, you know, everybody who, who likes science has to show them how they're smarter than the movie by pointing out scientific errors, which... Congratulations, scientists. You beat actors. Yeah. And, Good job, and, and, jerks. And, 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 <laughs> don't, don't do what one really famous planetarium director did and make a bunch of statements that half of which were, in fact, wrong, you know, and... You know, and sweeping statements that, you know, are easily debunked and other things were matters of opinion. You yeah, know? people uh, people were wondering. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Here's, here's my point on all of this. And it's about tenor more than anything. If the article is, hey, you liked Interstellar? Here are some scientific facts that you might enjoy if you liked Interstellar. And you can point out where you believe the facts of things depart from what is depicted in the movie and you can illustrate and educate people based on this work of fiction. It doesn't have to be like, LOL, look at the idiots in Hollywood are at it again. What and then work a malarkey. More like inner malarkey stellar. <laughs> Like, and, and, you know, like science. these are the same people who are going to love and and sing the praises of oh Star Wars and Star Trek. They inspired a generation, you know. And it's like there's this perverse thing where it's like the harder they try to get close to that, there are there's structure to telling a movies. There's things you can and can't do, right? And and the harder they try to tell good science the more this community freaks out and people love to brag about what they notice wrong. And I'm not, and like, and I would say that many of the people complaining aren't qualified that they're, we've, we've already seen, like I said before, another science writer, astronomer who had to retract an entire section of his criticism because he got his math wrong. And it's like, Oh, guess what? Kip Thorne knew what he was talking about. Um, Kip Thorne was the science consultant for science, yeah. And what's interesting to me was that they did what they did, which was really cool. Like the vision of the black hole, they actually went in, they sat down, they had their their visual designers spend you know days with Kip Thorne, get in the equations, and then went in and put into a computer simulator. And that is the most accurate visual representation we have of what that would look like. And now Kip Thorne is going to go off and write papers based upon how they're able to visualize that. Well, so this is, you know. And, and, and if I read, uh, there, there was a Wired article where it talks about how, you know, it, normally you just run a ray tracing program. But the problem is ray tracing follows the path of light. And when you yeah. got an object that does nothing but suck down light, you got to figure out a way to, you know, it's like, well, what if we represented the infrared background glow from behind it? And what would that look like? And then they wrote the equations. And when they ran, rendered it, and it took three hours to render a single frame, he's, uh, he's like, yeah, as a scientist, I Honestly, I had no idea what I was going to see. And it's like it came back and they were they're surprised. Yeah, which is pretty, pretty awesome. You know, so uh, can we talk about the ending? Yeah. Yeah. I think that as soon as I saw the ending, I, I the, the, the two things in, in thinking about it uh, were that I, I it was the reason why I immediately I went from thinking that it was going to make a lot of money to thinking that it's going to make good money, but it's not going to be Inception uh, for the reason that people could explain to their friends at a Burger King the complicated Inception devices wherein I don't think you can sit down at a Burger King and explain the ending of Interstellar in two sentences to a friend. Uh, oh, oh! You're talking about the ending, not him meeting his daughter as an old lady. You're talking about him, him uh, falling into the singularity of a black hole and finding himself in a three-dimensional construct. His ship, seemingly, you know, ending his life, finding himself in this. Uh, I don't even know what I mean. I guess like it is like a, a singularity of time and space and gravity where he is looking through uh, all well, versions of his daughters. Well, he specifically says that whatever the intelligence is that that um, was reaching out or making this stuff possible had clearly created a three-dimensional construct to represent 
five dimensional space inside the gravity, you know, so it's like he had to move and and was able to to access it. He was using the tools of a precursor race or whatever. Yeah. I mean, like and and I I liked it. I bought it. I don't know if I could explain it to a friend exactly what happened. Uh, and, and I think that that's, that's good, but it is limiting in terms of it being a, a, there are so many blockbustery kind of elements, big, you know, uh, emotional themes that to have something as heady as that be the climax of your film, uh, was, was, I, I, I don't want to say problematic cause I liked it, but also Andrew, we were talking last night that it kind of, uh, gives short shrift to the 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 daughter's arc, where it you, we, we kind of get get yada 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 on the most important element yeah. of the movie. I mean, my yeah, my narrative thing is that I thought that the the daughter story really was the center of it, and and it was told in montage and clips and stuff, and we just had to kind of go with it, you know, which was a lot to ask of. You know, Jessica Chastain's a great actress, but it's sort of this, we have to all of a sudden emphasize with this woman who her first thing is her kind of whining about how upset she is at her dad, you know, and it's going from the adorable little girl to this bitter, bitter woman <laughs> is a bit of a jump. And we understand, we, we tech, you know, it's one of those things analytically, and that's the thing with, you know, if, if I love Nolan, Nolan's like my favorite director, but I would say that, yes, analytically, everything made sense. Did it fit together the way it should fit together? Did I move from part to part in an emotional way? And no, I didn't. Um, well, uh, I, I, uh, that, that's fine. You and I, obviously, as we discussed, had different things on there as far as like it being, uh, and I know you don't want to say problematic, Justin, and I, I certainly agree if you are only looking at it as a box office purchase, you know, from in our movie draft game, then I, that I see where you're coming from, but artistically, structurally, this, this felt like, um, yeah, it's a strange ending, but so was 2001. You know, it felt it felt very similar to that. It was it was, you know, what happens when you go on the other side of an alien constructed hyper reality. And 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 2001 was a really weird ending that definitely nobody could um you know, talk explain to their friend at a Burger King afterwards, you know, and 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 obviously uh, it, it it you know, was was the the right ending, you know, as as artistically speaking. And I would say that like like I, I would kind of say, Justin, like I would think that the average moviegoer will probably be able to explain it, not accurately, but will have an explanation for it that satisfies them and they walk away with it. And that's why I was curious to follow the Rotten Tomatoes. And like I said, the Rotten Tomatoes score is like, it's of those big science movies, it's second only to 2001 right now. Yeah. Which, you know. Well, I think it's, it's, it's not that I would fault it for having an ending like that. It's that part of what has made Nolan special as a filmmaker is that he has taken complex, twisty ideas and through his craft made them far more digestible than they had any right to be. I, uh, but like, and, I think that you're overestimating people's ability to explain Inception. I think they know like they go into a dream, things happen in the dream, he, he gets out of the dream and he lets go of his wife, you know. And I would say in in gra in and he keeps going deeper, more layers. And it's more in inter dangerous. Interstellar, it's he goes into this black hole and he find he goes into the singular or goes into the wormhole, and then he has to go into the black hole to talk to his daughter to give her information, and then she gets the information. They save humanity, and then he goes off to live happily ever after with Hannah Hathaway and have babies now, on the planet. Actually, and I have forgotten this. Like, do do, do they explain how he gets from inside the black hole, singularity, whatever, to the hospital bed? Um, like well, it, it's it's like it's shut down by oh the, that's right her, what we her. are assumed to what he assumes is future humanity that has built this for us and was rescuing past humanity this whole time they they spit him out at the moment where he is like about to lose uh, oxygen supply floating okay. in space if as you, humanity's rolling through if you want to grade on a curve look at how many movies tried and I don't want to say flat out failed, but, but, but certainly failed to resonate telling similar th themes and stories. Um, 
uh, you know, certainly 2001 did did it right and did it very well. But it's like I think instantly of the movie, the Disney movie, The Black Hole, which uh, is unwatchably bad nowadays. Like you you look at it and it's just painful. But I remember having my mind blown, being haunted by uh, by by that idea of what's on the other side of a black hole. Uh, the the movie of of humanity rescuing itself. Uh, you you think of Millennium with Chris Christopherson, you know, which which again uh, and. Uh, I, I don't know. I think I think uh, you know grading on the difficulty curve, and again, it's better because they tried to get some of the science right. I I I loved 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 the idea that this like again I love the themes here because like I you know, my problem with two thousand and one is two thousand and one is a movie about God. They call it aliens, but it's about God. It's it's uh, hey monkeys, I'm going to give you this magical ability to make tools. All right, monkeys, come see, follow here, here. It's it's a it's an alien playing the role of God, but the idea is that humanity was incapable of itself, of and it's you know two thousand one's about intelligent design really, and here what I loved about this it was a humanist movie, very very humanist movie, and, and it was a movie that said that we're at this point right now where we don't have a lot of bold spirit, we don't have that, but we do have that, and that we we saved ourselves that it was that that it was what what made us special is what saved us and i love that idea that that i, I don't like day of the earth stood still i have a like day of the earth stood still i put it it's morally equivalent of the you know justifying when the conquistadors came over there and committed mass genocide because these indians were committing human sacrifice they're like listen you guys are morally inferior to us we're gonna wipe you out is that was wrong and so these alien race this hyper advanced alien race coming here and being like Hey, um, listen, uh, you guys are, you know, we're going to, we're going to just wipe you out because you're primitive. You know, it's like, wait a second, jerks. Um, that's, that's wrong. That's not, you know, what a highly evolved species should say. So. So actually, I'd never thought about that before. That's a good That's why point. I hate, I love Star Trek, but I sort of hate the smugness. Oh, we got rid of money. We, yeah, you live in this trillion dollar spaceship and go anywhere <laughs> you want. You don't have to pay for food or do anything, you smug bastards. Like, you know, for the rest of us, we don't have these luxuries. And you're char- part of the chosen few that gets to explore. All right. So um, and I, I think we all agree that Interstellar, the visuals are absolutely stunning. and Amazing. Uh, I, and I'm going to, I know, my, I'm going to love this movie the more every time I watch it. I'm going to love it more and more. Uh, whatever reservations I have, eventually I'll be like, yeah, that bothered me. But there's so much great stuff in it. I can't wait to watch it on, you know, on iTunes and watch the extras. You know, um, super, I, I have a lot of issues with this movie, but it's still a great movie. Yep. Oh, Agreed. yeah. I mean, it is, it is a great movie. Where do you rank it amongst Nolan movies? Uh, I would say, um, I mean, it's tough because, you know, I'm going to say like my enjoyment of it. Uh, I'll tell you what, mentally, I'm going to go back here. Um, I would let's say- actually, let's, let's, let's just, just for the sake of, of this ex- exercise, let's take out Batman. Oh no, I wouldn't even, Batman wouldn't even make my list. Wouldn't none, that's none right. of the Batman. All, all three, all three Batman movies. Then that's, that's no, I, 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 I don't, I don't sit in starry eyed wonder thinking about Ra's al Ghul. Uh, I sit in starry eyed wonder. Uh, there's three movies. Uh, uh, Nolan is three movies. He's inception. He's, uh, 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 he's, uh, uh, memento. And he's this movie. Uh, what about prestige? Um, oh shoot. That's a really yeah, good. Come point. on, man. Uh, that's uh, no, pre- prestige. Prestige was was fun, but not mind blowing. It it obviously wasn't sticky enough for to, to even make this list for me. Like I love Memento so much that I took a pirated copy and cut it front to back uh, just so I could watch it forward because um, I was so. <laughs> You're doing it wrong, Nolan. <laughs> yeah, no, well, no, no, no. I just wanted to know. I wanted yeah. to know if I would see it different, and I wonder how the story would translate in that situation. Um, I would say in order. Um, I mean, it might be uh, well. It's too too fresh in my mind. I'd say Memento of all time. Interstellar second, and then Inception. I've only seen Inception twice. I'm certain that I'm going to spend more time thinking about Interstellar. Right, uh, I'm going to let you finish, but Inception was one of the best movies of all time. <laughs> I mean, it was great. It was it was it was a great that, that movie. To me, that to me is my number one. Uh, I would I would have Inception number one. I would have Prestige two, Memento three, and I think this one would be would be four. And not that it, it's a tight list, yeah. you know. And and you know he's he's an amazing filmmaker. Uh, they all are extraordinarily worth watching and they're all achievements. Actually, I might actually put this one above Memento, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, just because, like, it is such an achievement visually. Like, it just looks so amazing. Yeah, what about what about you, Andrew? So, my pattern with Christopher Nolan films is I always walk out with a feeling of not knowing how I felt, liking parts of it, not being sure about others. 
Inception was probably the only one right immediately at the end I go, this is amazing. That I, I just it for it worked completely for me. So like Inception's kind of Inception's one of my favorite films of all time. Um Prestige is a movie that gets better every time you watch it because you pick much like too many cooks. You go back and you realize, oh my God, there's this detail here that I would never have known to know, pick up. You know, like like the first problem with Prestige was a lot of people had a, a difficulty with it is that you there's no clear good guy or bad guy the first time through. Right? You know, it's it seems a little bit ambiguous. When you watch it again, do you disagree, Brian? No, I'm just I'm just realizing that, that I think you've convinced me to bump prestige up. Uh, I, I, again, it's not a space that I go back to and think about a lot, but I think structurally, it's a masterpiece of a movie. It's so and, good. And you go back, and then you realize when you if you you know, like it took me third time, which other people would probably put up just the second time. The third time, I'm like, wait, there are three characters here, and one is a very passionate, loving, good guy that pays a price. And you don't know that the first time through because you're still just thinking the two characters. Then you go through it again. And then you realize, you know, then you realize, then you get to the idea of the Hugh Jackman character, like, holy crap, um, I'm looking at the thousandth version of him that's paying this price and being punished for this. It's so multi-layered and deep. You go, oh, wow, this is this. It, it, one viewing, it, it was so ambiguous to me. And that was my problem. Like, who's the good? I'm like, well, no, because there's there's two twins. And then there's there being one Danton and then a thousand Dantons. Right. And they keep punishing each other. And then, then the one good guy is the guy that has to pay the price in prison, et cetera. You know, so it's that's what I love about prestige is I go, it is a, it really is. It's a it's a beautiful movie and the idea that it really has to unfold over time and you have to sit there to look at it uh and answer your question i mean i i i need to i have to i walked out of this i took a, our friend mary to go see it and we walked out and we're both like there's a lot we liked there's a lot we didn't and i had a lot of issues with stuff and i'm curious to see what will happen when i go see it again and again and again and i know i will which is a sign of a great movie yeah people are paying patreon dollars for you to rank these right now <laughs> uh number one inception and uh, if we take in the Batman movies aside, number one, Inception. Number two, um, and again, I didn't like it. At, I liked it, like the concept, but I found it hard to watch. And I've only seen it maybe twice as Memento. So, like, I'd like to say Memento. I can't get it on iTunes. I wanted to go watch it the other day. Um, prestige. Prestige, Memento-ish. Prestige. Okay. Enter, uh, excuse me. Inception. Yep. Yep. Prestige, memento then Interstellar. Yeah, nothing oh. else. Like, like, like he had what, like uh, Identity and uh, yeah, Insomnia. I didn't care for. Insomnia. Knowing is good, but Knowing feels like you know it's a, a solid first film. I recommend you see Knowing if you get a chance. Yeah, Insomnia is one of those things that you just sort of forget about because it's like, all right, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's good. It's, all right, it's uh, good. It no, they're following. <laughs> following. Uh, yeah, the knowing was the Nick Cage. Yeah, Nick Cage. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> I would, it took me a moment. I was like, I was like, uh, bleh, bleh, bleh. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> I want to be the guy that defends it, even though I'm wrong. <laughs> oh no, no one had a, a thing to do with uh, 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 you know. It's great. <laughs> All Pretty right, sure I said following. <laughs> uh, I get. Uh, I guess we should wrap it up. Uh, man, I just we just spent forty minutes meditating on that movie. Uh, that's awesome. That's it, it, I mean, and something. that's the thing is, is for whatever you can say about it, it to nitpick the science, nitpick the plot, nitpick the story, nitpick the characters. It's a it, it is a movie to be discussed. And, and those are amazing when they come around. And I'm really, really excited that, you know, that he's he's a director that is is in, in a tremendous position to call his own shots and can just say, no, I'm going to do this movie with the cast I want, the budget I want. And the story I want, the talent I want behind it, and uh, I think it's it's amazing that it's out there, and I, I really enjoyed watching it. There are and there are some movies that it, it, you look back at certain things that at the time weren't as appreciated that we didn't quite we're like oh yeah, that's that's nice, and then you know like Back to the Future when that came out, you know, oh, a, there was, uh, yeah, it's a good movie, uh, good yeah, popcorn, play. yeah, it's fun, with some laughs, and then like later on, like you know, we're quoting you get you have. 15 year old kids today reenacting Ghostbusters and, and doing Ghostbuster lines. But even though this is a movie that was 15 years dead before they were born, you know, um, I, and I would say like, like Shawshank Redemption box yeah. office, meh considered arguably one of the most beloved movies of all time. Yeah, that's true. 
That's true. It's, it's, everybody finds something they like. I'm not saying Interstellar is necessarily going to be there, but when we start having, we look in that pantheon of science movies like Contact, you know, Contact. Oh, uh, one, one of the, I think Contact is one of the more underrated, unfairly uh, mm-hmm. underrated. Unfortunately, it got squeezed in the middle because fo- folks who love the books hated the compromises that were made in the movie, um, which, by the way, Matthew McConaughey, uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, people who were ignorant of the book, you know, it was a little too heady for them at the time. And so it just got squeezed. It's it's really good. Yeah, I think it has. I, I I didn't like the overall theme of it, but it certainly is worth watching. Certainly, certainly has a lot of great stuff in it. Why build one when you can build two? <laughs> <laughs> that is like one of my favorite scenes in all movies. <laughs> two uh, at twice the cost. You said, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. When you can build two at twice the cost. Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, you're right. Inception. You know what 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 a strange wormhole of a career Matthew McConaughey has gone on between Contact. You know, the, the heady science fiction films of Contact and Interstellar. Uh, you, you know, he bought a... Um, Oliver Johnson. <laughs> he, bought, he bought some uh, uh, framing. He came to the frame shop that Bonnie worked at when she was uh, uh, 20-something, and we had just gotten married. And uh, uh, she did, had no idea who he was. And he, um, uh, she said that he had obviously just been working, like building something or whatever, so it was all B.O. He brought in some, some, uh, <laughs> some paintings to get framed. And she was like, I'm, ha- I'm sorry, could you spell that again? And she saw the half smile. She didn't know what was up with that half smile, but only afterwards, when the people in the back saw the order, did she realize that this was the smile of a man who was being patient because you really ought to know who I am. <laughs> yeah, and, and you'll talk about this later. <laughs> and she has and did. Because he's from Austin. I would have never guessed. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> all right. How's it been? Uh, stellar. Yeah. But yeah. also. No, uh, sorry, I already killed it. <laughs> he already said it's been weird at the beginning. <laughs> uh, God, that was fun. That was good. Uh, that was a good chat. It's, yeah, it's so, it feels so good to have something that we all are passionate and, and roughly in the same direction, you know? So glad I got to see it yesterday. It was under the wire. Like, uh, I, I, I just barely squeezed it in. Uh, so we're calling it more like inner smeller, am I right? <laughs> what do we want to call this episode? Um, uh, see, first we talked about we had we a talked about web- uh, the spider factory. We talked about the oh. anaconda eating the dude on Discovery Channel. By the, by the way, the- I'm going to shut down the video recording because I, I don't even know if we'll release it. Somebody will release it. And we talked about uh, rogue-ass planets. Rogue-ass. You wanted to call it All Right, All Right? (laughs) (laughs) I feel like that's a bit too... uh, 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 Shh. <laughs> the one where we never mentioned SpaceX. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, we'll call it the SpaceX episode. Uh, I did it for the ratings. Um, uh, Weird Things HQ. That's the first thing we talk about. Yeah, yeah. You want to go with Weird Things HQ? Yeah, sure. All right. Save that, boss. Getting ready to upload it. Oh, yeah. All right, beautiful peeps. Man, I'm going to have to call it early today. I spent all day in the sun grinding out um, snow cones. Snow cone? Snow cone? Snooch to the booches. <laughs> That's uh, that, that Will Ferrell sketch where he's uh, the inappropriate father uh, yelling at his kid playing softball while everybody like just looks on horrified at how intense he is yelling at his son. And at some point, he just like pulls out, you know, beer, <laughs> like cans of beer. He's just like, snow cone? Snow cone? Anybody? <laughs> snow cone? <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, 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 all right. Um, well, 
I'm going to record the season finale of Who's the Boss with Ashley. What a great title. Is by the by the brilliant Andrew Main, which by, got got, a, got an audible laugh from Anthony Carboni when I mentioned it on I think it was on on Current Geek Weekly. Uh, so I, I am I am always so excited to tell people the the title for that show. That's awesome. Uh, all right, well I'll go ahead and shut down the stream. Enjoy. Uh, I guess you're going to be starting up uh, Diamond Club here immediately, right? Yeah, we're going to try and do that and and the new 